here we come, everybody. Um, welcome this evening. This is a, a very special evening for the Potomac River Jazz Club. Uh, my name is Ellie, Ellie Casa, and I do uh, their newsletter editing, and I've been doing some online um, uh, content help during this COVID thing. Uh, the Potomac River Jazz Club is celebrating uh, next year, our 50th year, in promoting and preserving traditional jazz in the D.C. area. And um, in addition to putting on monthly concerts and jams in the area, we also have a youth ensemble uh, jazz group that plays. And um, this is our first of our educational uh, outreaches that we're going to be doing. And hopefully even past the COVID time, we'll keep these going because uh, it's just kind of a, a fun way to get to see places maybe not everybody can get to and get to hear wonderful speakers like our speaker tonight. Um, so uh, Potomac River Jazz Club is on Facebook. Uh, we have a website which you got in the email with the Eventbrite link, prjc.org. And uh, check us out and look for some of our future online content. In October, we have Ricky Riccardi uh, in New York who is um, one of the uh, collections directors at the Louis Armstrong House Museum there, and he's going to be talking about his new book that just came out. So that's going to be a, a fun one, too. But without further ado, uh, John McCusker is going to be leading our, our uh, session this evening, and his reputation, reputation precedes him, I think. But photojournalist, author, uh, amazing speaker, tour guide, and um, uh, his heart is in preservation of so much of our jazz uh, history, the, the local New Orleans jazz history specifically. So I'm going to turn my um, hosting over to him and let John take over the reins. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. And hello, everyone. And I'm so glad uh, that you've all uh, chosen to join us. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, early jazz, specifically New Orleans jazz, uh, and uh, Kid Ory, who was the main uh, protagonist in that early movement. And what I find is if you tell the story of Kid Ory, you're really telling the larger story uh, of jazz history itself in New Orleans. Well, that explains the, the part of the name of the place that we've established here now. And I think we can go, Ella, do you need to get the screen share for me? Let's see. I switched you over to host, so you should be able oh, to Oh, I should be able to share my own screen like a big boy. Here I am. OK. So I hope everyone's can see that. We're good? Okay. All right. Well, I am uh, now uh, managing director of the 1811 Kid Ory Historic House in Laplace, Louisiana. Uh, in addition to being the plantation that Kid Ory was born on, the, the property is also the site of the largest slave rebellion in American history, which started here on January 8th, 1811. Uh, so we tell that story as well, and I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing just for a moment here. Uh, so, oh, geez, did I lose myself? Um, oh, brother. I'm still screen sharing. How do I? Where's the stop? Share the oh, there it is. Got it. Okay. Uh, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, two of the people who are volunteers uh, who have come forth to help us uh, put this together. Um, first of all, helping on uh, the 1811, uh, socially distanced appropriately from me, uh, behind me, uh, as Daniel Sennett's Jr. Daniel's New Orleans boy like me, and uh, he's leading uh, our efforts to uh, reanalyze and, and, and take another uh, deep look at the 1811 rebellion. There are two texts on it, but we find both of them uh, are lacking in different ways. So we're going at it. And Daniel loves his tigers and uh, he loves doing the research out here. So I'll say hello. And hey guys, my name is <laughs> Daniel Sinens. I've been working for a few months here and I actually did my master's thesis on the 1811 slave revolt as well. 
So I hope to get soon. I hope to get the exhibit up and soon so that we can have an interactive and fun way to share this history with you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Daniel. And then also the other person that's helping us out is going to talk to you a little bit more in detail is Charlotte Jones. Uh, Charlotte is, uh, is a master's student at, at Tulane and she has just uh, gotten a manuscript accepted by the University of uh, Georgia. <laughs> uga, uga. And, um, and she has put together a beautiful uh, display on the uh, agriculture and particularly the role of mules. And we know any jazz fans know that mules intersected with the life of uh, Louis Armstrong and Kid Ori as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'm going to go through and show you some pictures of the site. And I think Charlotte is going to tell you a little bit more and then we'll dig down into Kid Ori. So we'll go back to screen sharing mode. And there we go. And uh, so this is, there we go. There's the button. So this is the house where we're located. And um, we sit right on the river. We're about 30 miles up river from New Orleans. And one of the things we talk about in the 1811 exhibit is what set the stage, the context for the 1811 rebellion. And of course, what happened was we had colonial empires that displaced indigenous people and at the same time kidnapped sub-Saharan Africans and brought them here. And in fact, in this particular time period, in this particular place, they had gotten to the point where there were more uh, enslaved people and people of color than there were white colonizers. So it was a, something of a tipping point. If you look at the top map very closely, this shows a few scattered early colonial villages and there's still some Indian villages there, some Kalapisa uh, villages around in here. Um, you know, within a hundred years, you have what's below there, which is colonized, carved up American property lines and uh, the Indians are gone and it's entirely filled with, uh, with colonizers and people from sub-Saharan Africa. So as they say today, what could go wrong? Um, and what happened was in January 8th, 1811, uh, led by a man named Charles DeLong, uh, a group of enslaved people struck out at this house, then the home of Manuel Andre, who was the uh, captain of the militia here, wounding him. Uh, they then killed his son and they began a march on New Orleans. Uh, so we follow through and tell that story. And we've also uh, made a point of finding the names of as many of the enslaved who were involved in the rebellion as we can, trying to find out their stories, as much about them as we can, uh, so that they're not just things, slaves, a group, whatever, that they're human beings and that their names are here and their names are remembered. We're also going to talk a lot about a forgotten thing in American history, which is Reconstruction. Uh, remarkably, St. John the Baptist Parish, Louisiana, was the base of Reconstruction GOP politics during the Reconstruction era. And even after Reconstruction ended, they had a black sheriff and black legislators for 20 years beyond that. And that freedom was earned by men like this man, uh, Gordon. This photo is known, the main photo here is known by many as the scarred back photo. Uh, this photo was made about 30 miles from here. Uh, a man ran away after the Union Army got to Southeast Louisiana. He ran away and went to join the Union Army and they photographed him as a runaway as he looked for his Union uh, physical that he went through and dressed as a soldier with the U.S. Army. Powerful propaganda in the war effort. Uh, but 
we have this hung up if for no other reason to show this is what the the people of color around here did when given the opportunity to fight back all right and there's daniel doing his thing uh we introduced you there's charlotte isn't she cute? I hope your mom loves this picture. And uh, I'm going to let uh, Charlotte talk to you a little bit about uh, about the programs that we have here, and then we'll jump in and talk about Orion Jazz. Thank you, John. Um, hope everyone Charlotte, can hear me gonna, okay. Are you going to do, do screen sharing? Um, is it still on screen sharing? Yes. Yeah, we're going to stay right here. Okay, Nothing cool. separate. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, and if you did see my dog walking around a few minutes ago, I do apologize. She is our in-house security. She does the job pro bono, pun intended. All right, so again, my name is Charlotte Jones. I'm the programs manager here at the 1811 Kid Ori House, and I've curated an exhibit called Stomping Grounds, the Mule at Work, at, uh, Mule at work in Southeast Louisiana. Where'd it go? All right, next. One second, wait for the picture to go. There we go. Work with me. All right. So stomping grounds is about the ascent and decline of mules as the predominant work animal here in the South. The hybrid animals sired from jack donkeys and female horses became immensely popular after the Civil War on both former plantations and in urban environments. Planters preferred them for their hybrid vigor, um, believing that they could better withstand the heat here in Louisiana while being stronger than horses, but also cheaper to maintain. They were considered a huge um, kind of um, expense. There we go. All right. This exhibit will also explore how mules played a part in sharecropping, tenant farming, and specifically here at the 1811 Kid Ori House, sugar production. Uh, when Kid Ori was a young boy, he hauled water and breakfast to laborers in the fields Via, via an old mule. And by the time Ori moved to New Orleans, uh, over 131,000 mules worked in Louisiana. Uh, there he became well known for advertising gigs via mule and truck drawn wagons. And of course, cultivating the tailgate tr uh, trombone from the end of the wagon. So in some ways, these work animals acted as cr cultural cross pollinators and the development of jazz, which of course John's going to talk more about. Um, and those cities and farms eventually phased out these stubborn, bulky mules. Uh, they still retain a, a small but mighty legacy here in Louisiana through sightseeing tours in New Orleans, but also pulling a couple of parades uh, during Carnival and Mardi Gras, and also food vending. So it's a pretty interesting exhibit, I hope, and I'm very proud of it. And I'll go ahead and send it back to John. Thank you. Hey, this is just like the old Star Trek. Whenever like Mr. Sulu would get up, some other random crewman would come and sit in his chair. Uh, so, uh, all right, let's jump into Kid Ori and, and jazz history. And uh, are we back to sharing now? Uh, it's still sharing? Yes, you're still on screen sharing. Okay. Can I ask you a favor? Yes. If you see some folks in a waiting lobby, can you admit them? Because okay. I lose control of that. I lose that that control when you're on the uh, in the control box oh. there. I accidentally exited. it. Hang on. <laughs> oh, shoot. What did I do? All right. Okay. Go to I think participants. Yeah. Okay. And then admit, admit all. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, these are just joining us. Uh, welcome. So we're just about to start uh, talking about uh, Kid Ori. All right, so why do we talk about Kid Ori? Why do we care? Well, with Kid Ori, we have in his story the connective tissue that links our earliest jazz musicians, specifically Buddy Bolden, and our apex jazz musician, Louis Armstrong. Ori gets his first major musical influence from Bolden, and it's in the band of Kid Ori that a whole generation of important future jazz stars, Johnny Dodds, Joe Oliver, Johnny St. Cyr, and Louis Armstrong cut their musical teeth in New Orleans. And more importantly, those relationships and the way that those relationships and interactions developed played not out not only in the cabarets of New Orleans in the teens, 
but in the recording studios of New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles in the following decade. You might want to think of any kind of amalgamation musically of Joe Oliver uh, and Johnny Dodds or Louis Armstrong and Johnny Dodds or Kid Ory and Louis Armstrong. All of those are different manifestations of groups of musicians who first played together uh, in the Kid Ory band in New Orleans. Um, let me go through and go to our next picture here. So we tell that we try to tell the story uh, in as vivid a detail as we can. And of course, it's always about the music. Uh, so you can come in and listen to our music on a 78. You can listen on an iPad or you can just ask Alexa to play the music for you. So here's Kid Ori's story. He's born in 1886 on Christmas Day on an 1,800-acre sugar, sugar cane plantation 30 miles upriver from New Orleans. Right about here. His father was white. He was uh, descended of a former slave-owning family. His mother was Creole of color. By law, they couldn't be married, but they lived together for 30 years and raised seven children together. And this is what life was like here. You either owned a plantation or you worked on one. And that's what Ori did from the age of 11. He drove a water truck, uh, Charlotte was talking about, had to go and lasso that mule every morning, hook him up and take the water out to the workers there. And just to give you an idea how big the sugarcane plantation was, it took an hour and a half to get from the well to the farthest field and back again. Uh, today, it's such a big area that from the moment you get off the interstate coming from New Orleans to where we are, from the time you get off the interstate till you get to the river, it's about a four mile drive. All of it was this plantation. So that is the utter level of wealth that we're talking about that this system created. Ori's earliest musical experiences uh, in St. John Parish were uh, the showboats that came through, the French and the Price showboats that would come through. Uh, you also uh, had um, music teachers, itinerant music teachers. Uh, specifically in this area, we had Professor James B. Humphrey. He himself was a uh, Creole of color descendant of a rich uh, St. John the Baptist uh, white planner named James B. Humphrey. And he taught bands all up and down the river for decades and decades. His grandson, Willie and Percy Humphrey, in fact, became mainstays at Preservation Hall over the years. If you've ever seen Sweet Emma's band, that's her clarinet player and drummer and a trumpet player. Um, you also had benevolent societies, which sponsored funerals for their members when they died and anniversary parades for the anniversary of their, uh, of their founding every year, and they would hire brass bands. And Ori said that uh, he listened to brass bands out here all the time, the Pickwick and the Onward Brass Band, both of which were trained and, sent and initially created by Professor James B. Humphrey. Uh, benevolent societies were large. Black folks uh, as a form of social safety net would join uh, benevolent associations, and you put a few pennies in every month, and when you died, your funeral was paid for, um, and along with that, a band to escort you to the hereafter, and we we're very familiar with that in New Orleans, but it, it existed all up and down the river here at benevolent societies, um, and we talk a bit about that. Now, Ori's first music making was on a cigar box banjo he made himself. For all you musicians out there, think about taking your kids to a music lesson, and sometimes they have that same expression that your kids have when you take them to the dentist, right? Well, Ori was so excited to make music that he made his own uh, instrument. And I'll uh, stop the share for a moment, just so you can see. This is a cigar box instrument. We've got a few of them on exhibit in the museum. We've got one that's a century old. Uh, but if you're wondering just, you know, what is a cigar box 
instruments sound like. Here's just a little bit from it. So it's kind of like a ukulele with six strings. Uh, it doesn't project really well, but it, it became the first place for them to kind of think about chords and formations and, uh, and progressions. Uh, the next really important step for Ori uh, was huge. Uh, and that was when he made his first trip to New Orleans uh, to buy a trombone at the War Lines Music Store. He'd saved up his money from the harvest. So it would have been about this time this uh, in 1905, uh, this week in 1905, around this time, because this is the week the sugar harvest starts. And uh, that's where he encountered Buddy Bolden. Uh, it was a complete freak thing that he ran into him. Uh, or he was 17 years old. He, he, he went to Canal Street to buy his trombone, gets back to his sister's house, his older sister who lived in New Orleans. And unbeknownst to Ori, uh, the corner where she lived, Robertson and Jackson, was known to all the musicians in town as the hangout corner. If you hear Jelly Roll Morton's Library of Congress recordings, he talks about Jackson and Robertson as the hangout corner and, and other musicians too. So they're there and 17 year old Ori's at his sister's house trying out his trombone and a knock comes on the door and he answers it. And there's a tall kind of reddish skinned man with a very deep voice that says to him, which Ori imitated in his oral history as a young man is that you playing the trombone. And he starts talking to him and then he realizes this is Buddy Bolden, his first trip into New Orleans and he's got Buddy Bolden knocking on his door. Well, he's, you can imagine how excited he was, you know, that he thinks he's going to go off and play with Buddy Bolden, but his older sister disavows him of that notion and sends him back to the country. But Ori starts coming in to the city regularly and picking up what he can from Ori and learning what it is that Ori was doing that was, uh, that was going over with the audiences. And, you know, it, it's very clear that that's where he got his earliest impressions from. And in fact, later in life, he sat down with, his old bandmate, Bud Scott, uh, who also played with, uh, with Buddy Bolden at one time and wrote this remembrance. So these are a series of phrases that they remember Buddy Bolden playing and they called it calling the children home. You'll sometimes hear people talk about the back of town in New Orleans and uh, you'll hear all kinds of ideas about what that was, but what the back of town was and it sometimes get conflated with Storyville, which was the white red light district. What the back of town was, was about an eight or nine block area, which was where the black vice district was. Can you all see my cursor when I move it on here? Do you see where that pointing? Guess whose house that is. Anybody got a guess? <laughs> That was the childhood home of Louis Armstrong. This is where he uh, grew up with his sister and his mother at Franklin and Perdido Street. Now here's a nice interesting bit why we want to look at geography when we're looking at jazz history. You see that church building to the left of it there? Well, jazz fans know that structure is Funky Bud Hall. That's where Buddy Bolden played at the turn of the century. So. When you ask whether Lewis heard, Arm, Lewis heard Buddy Bolden, well, he heard him. I don't think he knew who he was, but he couldn't have helped but hear him because he was two doors down from one of his main uh, spots. Um, what just about every structure in this photograph is gone. Uh, the only ones that remain would be the Pythian Temple and oh, way over here, the Eagle Saloon is still there. This is roughly the area where New Orleans City Hall is now. But if you want to talk about a cradle of jazz, this is what we're talking about. And in fact, what you'll find is a lot of times with the black musicians, the Storyville white prostitution district got conflated with this one because they shared a street, Franklin Street. And the Franklin Street that ran through the black red light district also was the first back street off of Basin in the white red light district. So in a lot of people's minds, they just conflated that rather than thinking of the two separate districts as they were statutorily 
uh, created. Uh, but when you're talking about some of the first places where jazz was played, this is a prime place to look. All right, 1910, Ori brings his brown skin babies uh, to New Orleans. Uh, they're inspired to uh, come in and take on the city. And they get here and they immediately find their competition and it's Frank Dusen's Eagle Band. Uh, Dusen uh, played with Buddy Bolden and once Buddy Bolden went to the insane asylum, uh, Dusen continued with a lot of those musicians. And there are just stories upon stories in oral history about the Dusen band and the Ori band going at it. In fact, in 1910, Ori and Frank Dusen's trumpet player were arrested in just, they got down in the dirt in Rampart Street, just pounding each other uh, because it got so intense and they, uh, they both went to jail. Um, but they were the continuation of the sort of Bolden generation of musicians. Or he's a little younger than that. He's influenced by Bolden, but he's not necessarily looking to simply copy them because one of the things he's very uh, straight about is he also took influence from John Robichaud's Society Orchestra, which was a professional orchestra. They had reading, reading musicians um, and they showed up on time. They had nice uniforms, they looked good. So he took a lot of the P's and Q stuff from them, but played the blues and played hot improvisational music and it's went over with people. And over the course of the next nine years, the Kid Ori Band of New Orleans would be a, a real launching pad for the likes of Johnny Dodds, Jimmy Noon, King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Mutt Carey, Johnny St. Cyr, Tootie Garland, uh, Bud Scott, Ram Hall, a host of others. And as I said, these, these relationships were important, not just because of what happened in New Orleans, but that it played out in the rest of uh, jazz history over the next 10 years. So Ori leaves New Orleans in, um, in 1919, goes to Los Angeles. Uh, so much of the great migration story is told through the prism of, uh, of Chicago, but Ori decided to go to California. But I'm thinking this might be a good place to uh, pause and see if we uh, have any uh, questions up to this point. Do I need to unmute anybody? Let's see. They should have the ability to unmute themselves. Okay. Um, I can take control back temporarily if need be, but uh, let's see what happens here. Do we have any questions? <laughs> I've got a question. I'll dive in if you can hear me. Okay, I can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Um, hey, John. Um, I'm curious about um, some of the, uh, you know, you, you just showed some sheet music. I was wondering if there's some other music that you um, think that you can think of from the very early uh, Kid Ori days that we might still recognize today and whether it has, whether they were playing uh, music rooted in the mid 19th century and sort of the continuity between that old music and, and uh, stuff we might still hear today. Well, you know, that's a, that's a really good question because you know, a lot of, a lot of the histories as they're written will say, well, you know, ragtime had developed and blues had developed. So both of those are feeding in like it's all just a natural progression uh, of, uh, of things going on. When Kid Ori got to New Orleans in 1910 and Edward Garland, the bass player, joined his band, he said they were, quote, playing nothing but made up songs from the country. So at that point, they're not playing Maple Leaf Rag. They're not playing any named or Tin Pan Alley, we would call it sort of tune. They're just playing songs they made up themselves. And, and the, Kid Ori himself said this, they would go to New Orleans, they would get maybe one strain of a particular song, go back the next week at a strain of a different song and then put that together and that was their song. And that's certainly in keeping with the way a lot of tunes got disseminated in that period. We have another question that got typed in to me from Gloria. Um, she just says just a general question of how we can support the museum, which 
maybe you can address now or if you want to address more toward the end. Oh, let me come uh, back to that at the end, Gloria, but thank you so much. I, I'm glad you asked that question because it reminds me I did want to talk about that at the end. So we'll come back yeah, to that. Yeah, and we, in, in the email that we sent out with the Zoom link, there's also a place where uh, you can donate um, to the Potomac River Jazz Club. All the donations we get are going to be sent to the museum. And so that would be an easy link, but he'll also give you more info there. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, well, so Ori goes to California and in 1922, his band becomes the first African-American jazz band from New Orleans to make recordings. Uh, and they record uh, Ori's Creole Trombone, which was a song um, Louis Armstrong remembered them playing in New Orleans uh, back in the day. Uh, these are immensely collectible uh, records for a couple of reasons. One, of course, its status historically, there were only about 6,000 of the 378s pressed together, just uh, 6,000 of all three of them. Uh, and what makes them uber collectible is they were created at Nordskog uh, recording uh, studios in Los Angeles in 1922. So when Mr. Nordskog, you know, got his mask, got his uh, stamped records back, he put all these labels on them. Well, the Spikes brothers who had arranged for Kid Ori to record with Nordskog thought that he was making the records for them and it was going to have their label on it. So when the finished records arrive, they're furious. So they go get their own Sunshine label printed. And in order to totally cover the Nordskog label, they had to make it oversized. So it almost ran into the run out grooves on the 78. But under every Sunshine label on a Ori 78 is a Nordskog label. All right, well, we all know about the, the Chicago, uh, all the guys that went to Chicago. Uh, after being busted in 1918 while playing a gig with Kid Ory at the Winter Garden Theater in New Orleans, uh, Joe Oliver had had enough of the police in New Orleans, and he blew out of here and went to Chicago. Here he is playing in the stands at the World Series in 1919, the Black Sox uh, series, uh, we may remember. Well, Oliver, you know, made recordings and with his Creole jazz band, and then he started a new group, his Dixie Syncopators. And uh, he got Kid Ori to come from California to come and join him. And they made a series of records. Meanwhile, Louis Armstrong had heard that Kid Ori uh, was in Chicago, was coming to Chicago and wanted a trombonist for his Hot Five. And uh, we tell both those stories. Now, if you take a look closely at this panel, this is one of the historical panels we tell the story with. That piece of paper down at the left are the words to the Hot Fives version of I'm Not Rough, uh, written in Louis Armstrong's hand. You'll also see two arrangements written out by Lil Harden. All of these were in Ori's private effects that were donated. And I'll, I guess I'll say here that we have the largest Kid Ori holding in the world. Uh, we've got stuff in Jelly Roll Morton's hand, Lewis's hand, Lil Harden, uh, you name it. And we are setting up a, uh, we're setting up a, um, an archive so people that wish to study that can come in and do it. So Jelly Roll Morton finds out he's up there and, and he wants him in the Red Hot Peppers. And I, I tell this story in the book about Kid Ori and that'll make this picture that you're looking at now all the more incredible. One of the questions I'm always asked on my tour is, did Jelly Roll write out all the parts or did the guys improvise? And it's my favorite question to, ask, to get asked because I have a really flip cool answer to it, which is yes. Um, parts were written out like George Mitchell was not a hot trumpet player. He was a good trumpet player, but he wasn't really an improvising hot trumpet player. So all of his stuff was written out. Omer Simeon, you know, which had that, who had that New Orleans uh, in, input, you had Kid Ori, who was a hot player, not a re mainly reading player. Uh, Sometimes they didn't play the part that Jelly wrote out. And Ori tells the story about they were at a recording session and 
or he goes to play the trombone part that Jelly had written out for him. And Jelly just throws his arms up and he's like, he's like, whoa, 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 what is that? That doesn't sound like you. Tear that up, play it your way. I can't write your music. Well, imagine my joy when we got our donation of the Ori effects and I find this piece of sheet music in Jelly Roll Morton's hand with George Mitchell's trumpet part written out very nicely and the part where Ori's trombone part was ripped off the sheet music. He kept it as a souvenir to show how much Jelly Roll loved his music. And this is more of uh, our panel telling the Jelly Roll story. People always ask, where did the blues come from? Where did the blues come from? Well, you know, someday, one day, Jelly Roll Morton got asked that by Alan Lomax. Where did the blues come from? And Jelly said the first place he ever heard the blues was in the 2300 block of Toledano Street in Central City, New Orleans. So for what it's worth, <laughs> according to Jelly, the blues comes from Toledano Street in Central City, New Orleans. When the Jazz Age was over, we had the Great Depression. There wasn't really work to be found in music, and the work that there was was, was for reading musicians and arrangements and so forth, and that was never really Kid Ory's thing. Uh, so he spent the 30s working as a janitor at the Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, and around this time, they're starting to build the big roads and freeways in California, and they were filling up with crawfish, which the poor deers in Southern California didn't know enough to eat. So Ori and Barney Begard and a lot of the old New Orleans Creoles that lived in Los Angeles would run out to the barrow pits where they were digging and crawfish. And it was as a result of one of those crawfish boil sessions at Ori's house that he became a very rich man. Because what happened is they were having a crawfish boil and Barney Begard, who, you know, had earned pretty well as a, as a composer, as co-composer of Mood Indigo with the Ellington Orchestra. And having, you know, been around Ellington all the time, he understood the publishing business and so forth. So one day they're eating crawfish and he says, hey, Kid Ori, how much do you get for Muskrat Ramble? Muskrat Ramble was Ori's uh, composition. I sometimes call it... Uh, if in rock and roll, you've got Stairway to Heaven and Freebird. In traditional jazz, you've got the Saints Go Marching in and Muskrat Ramble. That's about the way I would put that. And, and Ori had never gotten a dime for it. Well, Barney Begard nearly spits out his crawfish, and he calls down to Vine Street in Los Angeles, where all the publishing was, and finds out who's got the copyright on Muskrat Ramble. And he calls the guy up, and no doubt the guy was really excited that a successful composer like Barney Begard was calling him out of the blues. So they make an appointment. He goes over there. And this and that. And they talk to each other. And he says, hey, I see that you've got uh, Muskrat Ramble. He goes, oh, yeah, it's a big seller, big hit. And he goes, well, let me introduce you to Edward Kid Ory, the composer. And even though he had lived in Los Angeles almost exclusively from 1922, until that moment, the guy wanted to claim that he couldn't find him. Kid Ori walked out of there in 1942 with a check for $9,000. That would have been a king's ransom back then. He buys a new house, and this happens around the same time that there, becomes, there starts a revival in the traditional jazz of the 20s. And his career launches, relaunches, and with the help of Orson Welles, the radio uh, and uh, the radio star and filmmaker, uh, his career shoots up again. He gets recording contracts, he's in films, and he ends up being far more successful than he ever was in the 1920s. And as these things go, he, with all the success he gets back after about 10 years of that in 1955, I guess hubris, you could say, maybe set in. Uh, his wife, since 1911, is cast aside. His best friend since 1910, Edward Tootie Garland. They get in a fight on the bandstand. Tootie pushes Ori off the bandstand and breaks a number of his ribs. Uh, and Ori has a new family uh, with a new woman. 
And it's something of a stink and a scandal in Los Angeles. And he ends up relocating up to San Francisco and finished his career. And uh, the last final details of Ori's life are not that particularly important, but we do uh, cover them. And just to sort of finish up here, uh, just because as, uh, as the comedian Martin Mull says, uh, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. Uh, we're going to uh, take a little look here at Kid Ori performing for us. And then I guess we can just open up to questions and uh, comments. And I'll look forward to, to hearing what any of you have to say. I'm sorry that you have to suffer through this boomer operating technology. All they taught us how to work were wah wah pedals. Okay. All right. I think this is us. Turn it up if you can. And I think you'll see here, if you watch his hand gestures, you'll see him operating as a band leader. All right, well, that was enough just to give you an idea. You know, when I first came across the name Kid Ori in jazz history books, they just talked about him as a sideman on other people's records and a figure in the revival. But once I did the research and found his story, I found that his real contribution was as a band leader, as having a band that had a style of playing that was successful in New Orleans, so successful that uh, unlike the Buddy Bolden band, with Kid Ori's band, the band transcended audiences. And eventually, most of the work that Kid Ori had in New Orleans was for white audiences, rich white audiences. And he just had a way of putting all of that together in a way that appealed to a mass audience. So I guess we could open it up to anybody has any questions or is wondering anything about our uh, facility or. I've, I've got a question about Ori and his playing. Now he was a tailgate style trombonist, which is a little bit of a different style than some people play. And I know uh, Freddie Lonzo is a tailgate uh, style player, but that's very rare these days. And I'm not sure that everybody knows what that is. And I'm wondering. Yeah, let me, let me talk a little bit that. about that. I'm glad you asked that question. Because sometimes you will read like, you know, hoity-toity, you know, latte drinking jazz writers, you know, poo-pooing Ori as a musician. Well, first of all, to look at him exclusively as a musician, I think you're missing the point because that's like looking at Ellington as a piano player, uh, is an analogous uh, comparison. Ori's style is always rhythmic. It's visceral. 
but it's almost never melodic. Um, he's came up at a time when what the trombone was doing, because remember, it's switching from valve to slide. So the ability of what you can actually do with the trombone is changing. So for example, if you look behind me, this is Ori's valve trombone from when he was in New Orleans. So what he did and sounded like on that horn would sound very different from what he did on a, on a slide trombone. But his sound is always rhythmic. Uh, if you listen to the Hot Five recordings, much of what he's doing, it's almost like punctuations in the sentence, commas, you know, underlines, that sort of thing. If you think of it that way, that's what his playing is. It's not a J.C. Higginbotham. It's not a Jack T. Garden. It's not a small trumpet. It's a rhythmic instrument that ties together the rhythm section with the front line in, in Kid Ori's hands generally anyway. Throw the floor open. Another question, if uh, if somebody else doesn't have one first, um, and uh, going back to you and the collection there. I mean, I know you've really poured your heart and soul into rescuing properties that are very important culturally to uh, music and New Orleans to jazz, um, and. Uh, it originally, your museum was going to open a little earlier this year and hasn't been yet. And I know you've, you've, you've uh, had to surmount various mountains and things. But could you tell us a little bit about, um, about how the property came to be a museum and, and kind of a little yeah. more about where it needs to go? Yeah, here's the progression. You, you know, the, the interesting thing is over the 15 years I researched Dory's biography, I never was able to step foot on this property. And it wasn't until 19, 2016, the last year of my newspaper career, that I found out the place was for sale. And I came out here with a reporter and we did a story on it for my newspaper. Well, about a year goes by and the architect that the new buyer had hired contacted me to just try to get some historical information because of my connection having written about Kid Ori. And what they learned in that process was that uh, contrary to what had been popular belief, the original Andrew Plantation house where the slave rebellion started, where the first blood was shed, is part of this house. Everything has been built out from that original structure. Uh, that was number one. And about a year ago, the owner of the property got back in touch with me. They had finished the renovation and it's gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. It's beautiful. Um, and he asked me if I want to put a museum in. I mean, this guy called me up and asked me if I wanted to put a museum in his gorgeous, gigantic house, the oldest part built in 1797, let me think. <laughs> and it, it just came, it was a bolt out of the blue. It was like a dream come true. You know, I'd retired from newspapers and it was just the perfect time uh, and the perfect project. And just parent, you know, just coincidentally, a year ago was when they, they were planning the 1811 reenactment. Uh, that was put together by a New York artist named Dred Scott. So we were a host in that and participated in that. And we, uh, we've just been working for a year now just to get the exhibits up, the Kidori exhibits up. Um, and we're just finishing getting the 1811 parts into place and getting our ADA elevator because we've got to have an ADA elevator and that's expensive and it takes time to get it in. So that's really the last hurdle between us opening. John, can you yeah, hear me? I have a, oh, I have hey, go a ahead. Yeah, John, this is Phil Adkins. Hey, Phil, how are you? Very well, how are you, my friend? Terrific. Hey, I, the, the, your depth of knowledge on, the, uh, on Kid Ori is remarkable and the collection sounds remarkable. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the plans for furnishing the interior of the museum in some of the period rooms, perhaps? Yes, well, this is, this is what we're taking very slowly because, you know, as I said, 1811 story has been told in a couple of different forums, but I don't think that the definitive telling of it has, has happened yet. So neither of the people that wrote about it were people that knew Louisiana, knew Creole culture, knew where to look for a lot of things, knew how to think about things particularly. And we were already finding stuff that neither of the authors ever touched. 
So we're trying to at once reanalyze and re-realize that story and at the same time find ways to, to bring it to life. Now, unlike most of the oil plantation houses on the river, we're not furnished like a manse. You know, we don't have the four poster beds and all that sort of thing. However, for the entry uh, room, what we're really looking to do is at least have part of it done with, you know, like a melon shaped bed, uh, head, head post bed as you would have from that period. Um, and many of the other artifacts, we've got a, a Campeche chair. So we're putting together some furnishings for that room just to sort of create a context for the 1811 rebellion. But, um, and I'll thank, uh, uh, Philip has been really great uh, for helping us. Um, when we think a lot of times about African-Americans in the country, and particularly the slave experience, a lot of times we think about how that happened in uh, culture and storytelling and music and, and those sort of things, even religion. And we don't think of tactile things necessarily. And one of the things uh, Mr. Atkins was really great about putting me on to was the story of pendant coins and their connection with enslaved Americans. That's one of the stories we'll be telling. And also the story of how beads, European produced produce beads became tool, tools of empire from West Africa to the Great Lakes to even down here in Louisiana. So we have examples of those thanks to uh, Philip actually donated uh, some beads from his collection to to fill out that story about beads and coins as tools of empire used for self-expression. We're using a lot of maps too, like I opened up with earlier, just to show, you know, all change is violent to some extent, but, you know, when we think about colonization, we think about it in terms of the founding of our country, but not only did that process cause incredible violent and uh, upheaval with the people that were living here. And it not only affected the Africans who were kidnapped and brought and made to live here, it did incredible violence to the African communities in West Africa. You know, from Gore Island, you know, down Ivory Coast, all of what they called Guinea. Uh, you, the, the colonizers did the same thing there that they did here, where they pit one Indian group against another. That's how they defeated the Chidi Macha. They did the same thing in West Africa, and they pit, you know, one ethnic group against another. So it was, it was an incredible amount of violence and upheaval. And it's surprising in a way that, you know, there was only one major uprising having thrown all those people together. Um, how you going? Can you hear me? Yes. I was just, you, you were talking about, you, you, sorry, I'm in, in Australia. Um, so I hope Why are you sorry, mate? <laughs> hey, how you going, mate? Good how day. <laughs> You were talking about, um, I think, some uh, listening to some old Ori interviews before. Did he do some, was, was he recorded doing interviews like Jelly Roll Morton was? Yes. Yes. And, um, and what I did was, uh, up until 2000, I collected as many interviews as I could find. And... Uh, he was interviewed extensively as his comeback was happening. He was in Downbeat every other week. He was in, um, uh, what were some of the other, uh, Melody Maker and all those other music magazines that were out. So there was a great deal of material there. Uh, additionally, Ori is mentioned by a host of people whose oral history is at the Tulane Jazz Archive uh, at Tulane University. So I went through and listened to all of those and what people said about the Ori band. You know, a, a lot of times I'll hear people dismissive of a particular phase of New Orleans jazz history because say, oh, well, he's just saying that. Well, okay, he's just saying that. But if 10 other guys are also saying it, then maybe there's some validity to the thing that they're saying beyond the guy just saying it about himself. Uh, but the real kind of, uh, turn for me was in 2000, I got access to a nascent, uh, never finished autobiography uh, that Ori had started in 1950 with his then mistress and later second wife, Barbara Ganung. And what was useful about that wasn't so much the stories that filled in details of his life, but it mentioned actual things that were happening in the world, which allowed me to firm up dates 
and all those stories that were in the interviews you were asking about, that allowed me to go, aha, 1903. Ah, no, that would have had to have been 1905. For example, uh, the story, the reason I know that he met Buddy Bolden in 1905 was because the story he tells about meeting Bolden, he said the reason that he was staying in, it was around the time he came to New Orleans and stayed with his friend who was working on installing the City Park Railroad. Well, that's easy enough. You go to history book and find out the City Park Railroad was installed in New Orleans uh, in the summer and fall of 1905. That's not something someone would lie about in an interview trying to get glory on themselves. It's just a one-off kind of mention, but it's gold if you're trying to figure out when things happen in history. And I suppose none of that, none of what he was written would ever, we'd ever be able to do uh to read it, would it ever be published at all, or is it not sort of completed? No, it's 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 all in my book. Uh, yeah. uh, Creole trombone, Kid Ori in the early years of jazz. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's one of the main voices in the book. Is yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a problematic document because it was written down because Ori's practically illiterate, so there's very little of anything in his hand. So everything that was written down was written down by his second wife who had her own agenda. And that included rewriting his racial history. So it's something of a minefield. Uh, so you have to go through and be able to figure out where she's coming in heavy handed and changing a fact because she's uncomfortable with it. And what, what about, sorry, one more question. What, no, what about, please. What, what I noticed you've got, that's a valve trombone from the 1800s behind you. Um, did you add to some of his later recordings, you know, say from, you know, when he was doing his recordings in the forties, do they still exist or? Oh, all this stuff still exists. Now this, trombones. yeah, this is, this valve trombone was made sometime between 1917 and 1919. And this was, okay. or he still had it with him at the time of his death. Okay. Yeah, um, but no, we've got his 1922 recordings. We've got all of his recordings with the Hot Five, uh, you know, the Red Hot Peppers, King Oliver, the New Orleans Wanderers, the New Orleans Boot Blacks, uh, Lewis Russell's orchestra. And then we've got all of the revival uh, records as well. Uh, we sell the records in our bookstore. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool compared to a lot of, you know, old bookstore, I mean, old, uh, plantation houses with gift shops because our gift shop's got 78s it's got lps we've got original ori sealed lps you know they're 50 years in the shrink wrap we also repair and uh and sell uh, victrola phonographs and we okay. sell the cigar box guitars too so it's not a bunch of plastic tchotchkes here we're really trying to to sell you know products of the of the folk artists here in new orleans Thanks. Hey, John, it's Andy Taylor. Um, yeah. Hey there. Hey. Um, yeah, I was wondering about a technical question about all your posters and stuff. Like, who were the team that you worked on? They're, they're very beautiful and, uh, you know, chock full of information makes me, makes me want to be there. But, um, yeah, I was, I was wondering how long you've worked on them and, uh, and uh, how that's going, working on the, uh, the Slave Rebellion uh, posters as well and how, how far along you are. Well, I started working. Uh, <laughs> I started working on intensely on designing the posters right after Mardi Gras, and uh, so that was my COVID therapy. And I put together uh, rough panels through the whole exhibit, and then I sent them to uh, a wonderful young designer, uh, Cars Stewart. It's located in the uh, Lower Nine in New Orleans and uh, Cars did a beautiful job with them. And then we sent them to uh, Megaprint in New Hampshire and had them printed up on uh, on three quarter inch Gator. And uh, we're real happy with them. They're really pretty. And, and in the other parts for 1811, we're doing a lot of our panels there with wallpaper. Um, and it looks it looks really nice, like almost murals on different parts of the walls. And we've also you know got a few artifacts 
in there to really try to make things uh, vivid for everybody. Thank you. Sure. Do we get another question or is that just another ding in? I think it's just a, a ding from somebody leaving. I don't see any hands up or anything. Okay. Uh, well, we're hoping if you want to watch for news of our opening, we're at the 1811 Kidori Historic House dot com. Uh, we're also on Facebook, uh, 1811 Kidori Historic House. Uh, you know, and as soon as we get our elevator and pass our fire marshal, we are looking forward to opening to socially distant, history-minded geeks like us everywhere. And I look forward, and I say that with great affection to all of you. And, and I'm so touched that we have, we've, we've covered different hemispheres here. Um, so thank you very much to everybody uh, for coming. And I'm, I'm very humbled and I'm, I'm very appreciative to have shared our project with you. This is really fantastic, John. A great, great presentation and, and picture into what you've been doing there. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, uh, again, the email we sent out has a link where you can do donations. We're going to gather them and we're a, a, a nonprofit too. You know, you can write those off. We're going to send everything over to the museum that comes in. Um, and also we did do a recording of the session and if the quality of it comes out okay, we will post it on YouTube. And I will just send a link around to everybody who registered for the class if there's anything you want to go back and look at or, or share it with someone. Because, uh, you know, until, until this place is fully, fully open and the public can go in, it's a great way to get a taste of what's happening there and, um, and, and get a little attention shown on it because it's, it's a very interesting property and story. Yeah. Yes, and we're here. So, you know, if, if you're doing any kind of research on jazz history in this early period or you're looking uh, for some sort of guidance on maybe uh, books or something like that, our phone number is, is there on the website. Give us a call and we're, we're happy to even settle bar bets if you got a jazz bar bet. <laughs> 25 years of, uh, of jazz tour guiding and I've been asked just about every question. So... Uh, <laughs> So I'll happy to help you any way we can. And we've also will be making archival materials available at some point as well. So thank you. Before everybody goes, hi, it's Joel in Washington. I'm one of Ellie. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Joel. I'm sorry. Great, because I can speak really loud if you want me to. Oh. Uh, Drama. Uh, I'm one of Ellie's colleagues in the Potomac River Jazz Club. And as we set out to do this and go down the road of presenting educational uh, uh, streams. Uh, I'm just curious about how everybody, I know how John got here, and I know how Ellie got here, I know how I got here, but how did most of the people get to hear about the stream tonight? I, don't all speak at once. Uh, let me look at my screen. Andy, can you open up? I I saw it, I saw it on uh, Facebook and I saw it through through John's social media. Uh huh. Okay, Gloria. And thank you for putting this together. Yes, thank you. That's, that's Ellie, and John. Uh, Gloria. Yes. Hi, Gloria. Um, I think Gloria probably found it on Facebook because she's been communicating that way, and she's just saying um, to remind. I did. You, yeah, remind I you. I did find it on Facebook. Excellent. Remind you, John, just to talk about other ways that they can help uh, help bring attention or, or whatever to the museum. What, how can they help you do more? You know, really more so than money, you know, and, and just so you know, we've launched as an LLC because from an LLC you can become all sorts of different things and it makes us more nimble as an entity going forward. So, you know, we're not uh, a foundation, but in a way, uh, the, the funding of this is all coming from me. Uh, this is basically my nest egg for my journalism career, and I'm just going, what the hell? Uh, you know, for 15 years, I tried to get jazz landmark owners in New Orleans, like most recently the Buddy Bolden house, to sell their house. They're, they're letting the house fall down, and for years I've offered to buy it, and they wouldn't sell it. So finally, 
uh, Tim Sheehan, the owner of the Woodland, approached me and I said, all right, well, I always said if, if I got a cooperative owner, I put my money where my mouth is. And now my money's where my mouth is. And uh, so this has been entirely just a labor of love on my part. So the real help is just with the people that help, Charlotte and Daniel just coming and volunteering and working with me. Uh, Cause it's, 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 we're not open yet. So it's just basically, uh, it's like owning a boat. We just stand around it and throw money into it all day long. <laughs> but our, our main uh, goals right now are, are just, you know, if anyone, particularly people that are in the DC area that maybe are in the museum circuit, you know, if we can get our hands on a nice old museum display table, like one of the, the glass tables that you can put artifacts in, anything like that, any kind of cast off from any other museum, uh, uh, cane boiling bowls, the pots that are on every plantation. Of course, the people that sold this one took every last one of them before they sold it. So, so that's gone. So mainly, you know, the best thing is just if someone wants to donate an item or loan, just put on loan with us an item uh, from that era, like if that's how they would, if they would care to help in furnishing our 1811 room, particularly because, you know, a, a, an 1811 armoire is $8,000. Um, so that's a priority, but we're not going to get to it anytime soon. So things like that, any kind of service or any kind of volunteers that people want to come and help us tell our story, you're welcome. Look forward to seeing you sometime when New Orleans opens again. I'm looking forward to it too. And and then you and I can take a moment at Fritzel's maybe. I was in journalism also, and then you can explain in detail to me the concept of nesting. <laughs> <laughs> he was an owner. Have a nice night and thank you. You have a nice night. And uh, funny, we may have crossed paths in Fritzl's before, my brief jazz band I had before Katrina. That was the one good thing Katrina did is it broke up my jazz band. I, I just want to plug uh, John's book, Creole Trombone. For anybody who loves New Orleans and uh, loves that era of jazz history and just history in general, you know, the, the uh, journalism background is very evident and uh, it's, it's a remarkable story. And he, He's a, especially at that time, Ori's a pretty amazing guy. So uh, I, I think uh, everyone would enjoy it very much. Giacomo book, the beautiful photography in the Giacomo book on the Mardi Gras Indians is, is just fantastic too. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it. John, yeah, just like not, this... there's not a lot of guys from O'Perry Walker where I grew up in Algiers that, that read books. <laughs> 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 so, I feel very fortunate that I found a publisher that want to publish two of mine. <laughs> John, I'd just like to say I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all were all great. And uh, y'all have a y'all have a wonderful night. And if you, you care to follow up with us uh, on social media, you know how to find us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Night. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Ellie. That was nice. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.